Innovation Rockstars. Innovation Rockstars. Today with Caroline Snyman from Distel. Hi, and welcome back to the Innovation Rockstar interviews. My name is Chris Mulrod, and in this episode, I am pleased to welcome Caroline Snyman from Distel. Caroline is leading innovation strategy for the group, and moreover, she is building innovation as a strategic capability across the organization through internal and external collaboration to build the business of tomorrow. So in this episode, we will talk about why purpose-led innovation has become a truly business-critical capability for Distel. So Caroline, thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be on your show. All right. So we kick this off, as always, with a short 60 seconds introduction sprint about you, your career and your role at this tale. So, Caroline, the stage is yours for the next 60 seconds. Let's go. So I live just outside of Cape Town, which is based in beautiful South Africa. And I've been with Distel, which is one of the leading alcoholic beverage producers in South Africa and Africa for the last 20 years. Um, I've had the privilege of having an incredibly varied career. I started off in the supply chain. Uh, I was the technical manager there. And so I oversaw all of the te technical aspects of distillation, spirits production, and very exciting also new innovations in the spirits department. And after that, I was promoted to business director for the spirits business, uh, which was really all about leading and driving the growth strategy of our spirits business. Thereafter, I actually veered into marketing and um, I first looked at establishing a premium portfolio of brands for Distel. And after that, I was marketing director for Southern Africa, which basically entailed the oversight of our full brand portfolio for the Southern Africa region. And today I'm the group innovation lead, which is a hugely exciting role because I get to take all of my technical skills and all of my commercial capabilities and put them together and spend time understanding where new frontiers for growth for Distal may come from in the future. Beautiful. Okay, now as a next thing, I will give you three sentence starters uh, and I would like you to complete them. So the first one is, uh, I did my PhD in wine biotechnology because? Because genetics really fascinated me and I had a huge interest in understanding how wine chemistry can take on such magic proportions from a sensory perspective. Wow. Okay. So I'm, I'm curious to hear your answer to the second sentence, your completion for the second sentence. So number two is today for the first time in corporate life, I reveal that. That I probably do my best problem solving and idea generation on the back of my horse when I'm riding around the farm. Got it. Okay. And finally, number three, um, when disruption is knocking, you better... Think long and hard about the consequences and have more than one plan. Great answer. All right. So, Caroline, here's something else that interests me personally. So, uh, I got to know you are a judge, uh, for example, at the old Mutual Trophy Spirit Show. Can you tell me what is it like to be a judge for spirits and, and what does it take to be one? Yeah, Chris, that's a really interesting uh, facet. It's something that I really enjoy. And um, I always find it's a great privilege and a learning experience to be a participate in those panels. Uh, spirits is um, something that you take long to really train for, to be able to uh, judge and evaluate objectively and consistently because you're always dealing with very high alcohol strength products. So it did take some years of training to be able to do that. But I really enjoy the experience because it gives me an opportunity at both local and international shows to really see how South African products and international spirits products are evolving and stand up in terms of the test of quality. And generally, I'm very pleased to say that in most instances, uh, South African local spirits really do stand up very well to international benchmarks across the categories. Oh, well, certainly they do. So that's great to hear. Thanks for this um, insight. And now let's turn our focus to your story. So, you know, in this show, we often talk about innovation and strategy and how they positively influence the corporate mindset, 
and also the corporate processes in the long term. And uh, why that is, of course, true and incredibly useful. Uh, in this episode, we talk about tangible examples where the innovation capabilities of an organization really had to manifest themselves quickly to ensure the relevance of an entire company with thousands of employees under severe and unexpected pressure from the past COVID-19 lockdown. And now it gets even better in, I guess, in August 2021, I, f I found a report from your uh, head of investor relations um, that this tale actually celebrates triple profit growth despite the booze bans, right? And that blew off my mind. And I thought to myself, hey, I have to learn how they did it. But first, let's go back in time. Uh, can you describe the situation in South Africa in the days leading up to uh, and during the announcement of the lockdown and uh, how it felt during that time? So I guess for all of us, irrespective of where we were on the planet, March 2020 was a very, very uncertain time for all of us. And from a South African perspective, Europe started entering a lockdown a couple of weeks before we did. Uh, so by early March, we had seen half the world go into lockdown and we weren't quite sure what the South African situation was going to be, whether we would also follow suit or whether our government would take a slightly different route. So that, of course, indeed is a highly dramatic situation. And at what point, at what point in time did it become clear that the lockdown would have such a drastic impact on, on Distel and its entire operations? So, Chris, but I think by the 18th of March, it was middle of March, uh, we had our borders closed and all our big public gatherings, much like the rest of the world, had been banned. But it was actually only a week later, on the 23rd of March, when our president announced that we would follow suit with a really hard lockdown that would start on that Thursday of the same week. And uh, what we knew at that stage is that it was going to be a full lockdown for 21 days. But what only became clear on the 23rd of March is that we were only allowed to operate with essential goods and services. And in this instance, what that meant is that alcohol wasn't considered an essential good for sale. And alcohol production wasn't seen as an essential service that could continue with its operations. So we had four days to try and figure out what that impact would be on our total organization across the country. And by Thursday night at midnight, all our operations and all of our sales activities had to stop. So it was certainly something that we hadn't expected. Um, it wasn't a precedent that had been followed in any of the European countries or in the States. So it did catch us by surprise, big surprise. And what I, I think at the time, what we didn't realize is um, we'd all anticipated that it would be a 21-day lockdown. So closing operations for 21 days, I think we could still reasonably get our heads around. But in actual fact, what materialized was a 66-day um, halt of all operations before we went back into business. So only a very short amount of time to actually understand the impact. When you compare this to, you know, the classical foresight activities that take, I don't know, weeks, months, or even years to, to, to evaluate and understand of the impact, there was certainly no time, you know, to do that. And now we, we are exactly at that point, right? In such a situation, you, you really have just two options, right? Innovate or die. Uh, and now that it has become clear that the only real option for this still is to innovate and, and to innovate as fast as possible, how did that go? Did, did someone just make the call and say, yeah, we're, we're just going to do it like this and, and, and let's go? Or, or how, how did you proceed? Yes, Chris, I think that's a great question. And I, I do think you're right. We all made a call to see what we could do. Basically, the lockdown affected our entire business. So we, there weren't any products that we could actually sell even though we had one or two small non-alcoholic uh, beverage brands in our portfolio, just being able to supply that at the time in the midst of everything else was just not possible. And so we sprang into action. It was a collective team effort. And I think you said it up front, you know, your foresights and your insights work from an innovation perspective doesn't prepare you when big change suddenly comes knocking on your door. But it also created a tremendous opportunity for us because I think my biggest uh, learning and experience out of all of this was how immediately the situation created an incredible platform for purpose. And we had employees uh, 
working virtually from home, but everyone somehow wanted to make a difference, even though they weren't able to make do their day jobs. And I think that was an incredibly compelling piece of energy um, and focus that really enabled us to think about how we could accelerate innovation. And from a from a timing perspective, how, how did that look on the you know timeline? Can, can you elaborate a bit what happened when? How quickly did you move? What were kind of the steps taken? So. Actually, just before lockdown, we had started a very small innovation project that actually kicked off just when we saw the first COVID case announcement um, coming through in South Africa. And there was an incredible scramble for hand sanitizer. And we had national so shortages of hand sanitizer almost immediately. That market just had not foreseen what was coming down the line at all. So we started a very small project, um, uh, probably the uh, early second week of March, It was a team of three people and we sat down and we said, well, is there a way that we could produce hand sanitizer internally and at least make enough available to all of our sites and our employees inside the still? Then what landed up happening is the hard lockdown and our sites weren't operating and government and the public and charity organizations all across the country were crying out for sanitizer to try and keep people safe. So we turned a three-man project into a 28-team, fully cross-functional um, initiative across the business. And I'm very proud to say that we managed to go from ideation to first product produced within 28 days. It was a real team effort. So uh, 28 days is no time, right? So uh, what, what, can we talk a bit about you know, resourcefulness? Like, what are the best you know, some of the best resources or capabilities that have helped you to, to change direction that fast? Well, I think in this instance, we were incredibly fortunate because normally with any of these innovation projects, I'm sure most corporates need to think long and hard about how they prioritize um, and which resources they make available for projects. But in this particular instance, we had a huge base of able and willing and highly skilled employees who were ready um, and working from home to and wanted to participate to make a difference. I think that was a huge learning for me, that you must have availability of open-minded, very resilient, nimble, fast-acting, cross-functional team members in a situation like this. And then what we also experienced is coming out of that, as much as we had built a brand new category in a very short, short space of time, we saw the other knock-on effects of thinking differently and um, just getting new perspective on what other opportunities may, out, may be out there. So one other example of this was actually in our marketing environment. As you can imagine, we weren't able to communicate to our consumers about our products because we weren't able to sell them. And over a period of time, we started to see some real opportunities for our brands to align with things that were actually important to them. The best example that I could give you is we have one of the leading premium cider brands in South Africa called Savannah. Savannah for the last 20 years has stood for its dry sense of humor and has always showcased local comedy. And what happened in the lockdown is that the entire ent in entertainment industry, as it did globally, came to a screeching halt. So here was a perfect opportunity for Savannah to actually showcase the plight of our local comedians and to create online platforms where people could still enjoy the entertainment um, and for us to, in, in, in some form, at least provide some continuation of livelihoods for our comedians. And there were many other examples of that in our business over time as well. I think it also catapulted um, our thinking around non-alcoholic beverages. So we always saw ourselves as an alcoholic beverage producer. And suddenly when you're not able to sell what you're really good at, you have to start thinking differently about that. So it's, um, in the short term, we had incredible work done by our marketing and our technical teams to produce a non-alcoholic cider in record time. And From an innovation perspective, we did quite a lot of deep, thorough work on understanding what a longer term, low and no alcohol portfolio could look like for Distel. And I'm quite pleased to, to say and excited to see how it's going to work out. We have um, a product that is launching in October in South Africa. So we'll see how the results of those efforts go and come alive. This is really an inspiring and a, a great story around, you know, pivoting. So what, what about the factories and the machines uh, that you have kind of, you know, reused or, or, you know, put them into a different 
a purpose? Will, will it stay the way as it is? Will you keep on producing, um, you know, for example, hand sanitizers, or will you just revert back to normal um, after uh, you know the situation will be back to normal? So that's a great question, Chris, um, uh, because I do think, you know, it's one thing pivoting quickly when you have an imperative or a burning platform, but then big businesses always need to ask themselves strategically, I've created a new product category, is this still worth it for me in the long term when business normalizes? And at this stage, um, we are still selling and producing sanitizer, nothing like the quantities that we were 18 months ago. But I do think we'll, we'll see how that has to pan out over the next few months as the, as the pand- pandemic shapes and morphs over time. But I'm very pleased to say that from a non-alcoholic perspective, yes, that momentum has stayed. Uh, the brands are actually showing consistent sales momentum. And I think that's also in line with global trends in our industry. So how, how you know, what, what does this kind of disruption actually do to, you know, the, the, the mindset of an entire organization, of an entire group? So I, you know, of course, the past 18 months had been immensely intense, right? Um, so can, can, you, can you talk about a, a bit about how the, you know, past 18 months changed the perspective of Distel on, on the perception on, you know, strategy and innovation as a whole? I think pre-COVID, Distel always viewed innovation as all of the collective efforts that you could do to make sure that your business remained cost efficient and uh, really relevant for consumers. So I think we were very much driven around a core innovation strategy and coming out of COVID or actually living through COVID, I think it's made us realize as an organization that we have to think beyond the core. When your business is suddenly just stopped by factors that you hadn't seen, you've got to start thinking about where else you might prevent um, or mitigate future scenarios that could put you in a similar position. So for us, it's created an, an immense shift in our innovation strategy. As much as our core business really remains business critical and we'll, we fully committed to driving innovation in that portfolio. I think it's made us realize that we also need to focus on adjacent and informational innovation. There are huge opportunities that change brings along and they can create incredible horizons for future growth. So that is really where our focus has shifted to now as a team. So you mentioned the focus shifted, you know, away a bit away from the classic core, you know, innovations, and uh, you are also now exploring adjacent and maybe also transformative um, opportunity fields or innovations today. So um, how, how did that go? I mean, c- can you talk about, um, you know, what are these, you know, adjacent opportunities or even transformative innovation opportunities? Obviously, not uh, telling something um, confidential today, but um, I would be interested to hear what fields are you exploring? What's kind of, you know, up next? Probably the easiest way to explain it is to just think about the definition of adjacent innovation and transformational innovation. So how we view adjacent innovation is really thinking long and hard about existing assets or existing capabilities that we have inside Distel and how we could put them to use in different ways. So for us, um, that could be other beverages, given that we're, we're already rigged as a, as a beverage business. It can also be about leveraging our go-to-market capability, um, our deep consumer insights and understanding the future needs of consumers um, and what, what may be required next. So for me, that adjacent innovation piece is really understanding where there are pieces of our existing organization that we can continue to leverage and build in other directions. And then on the transformative side, This is where we're starting to look at completely new and different business models. Um, Probably the easiest way for most businesses, and I I don't think there's any surprises here, is just understanding the value of digital platforms and shifting consumer engagement models um, in a completely different way. So transformative really for us is businesses that take on a completely different shape and form to where we are today, but somehow ideally you want to be able to link them back and provide additional value to the overall organization. Yeah, so that, that that's a valid point. I think, you know, recently uh, we have also, um, you know, seen a couple of stories where, for example, from the sports industry, right? So where, you know, um, before this, uh, let's say, heavy digitization push um, actually took place, um, you know, they were just, you know, investing not a, a small amount or small sums of uh, human capital and also financial capital into, you know, digital formats of engaging with fans, for example, right? So we've seen a couple of soccer or football arenas now heavily investing into finding new ways um, similar to, you know, engaging customers 
maybe by digital platforms on your side. So interesting to see that there has been a tremendous push on these kind of formats and ultimately then, of course, on the business models, uh, because certainly you do earn money differently uh, with that than before. So, uh, Caroline, if I would ask you to summarize some of your learnings from the past 18 months, um, what, what would be your advice to other organizations out there that uh, face similar challenges or uh, are highly likely to face similar challenges in the future? So reflecting on the last 18 months and then thinking very specifically, you know, fr from an innovation capability perspective, I think most of us innovators across organizations spend a lot of time and effort investing into futures, future state thinking and foresights and insights. And then probably the second capability that we're all intent on building is really making sure that we follow human centered design principles. But I think what I've learned uh, over the last 18 months is as much as those two are absolutely core foundations that you need to enable innovation, it's also really important that you build team capacity within the organization. So building strong cross-functional teams with open-minded, resilient, agile team members who most importantly are able to connect the dots across various pieces of the organization, I think is another critical skill that you really need to implement innovation very quickly. I think for me, it's the difference between having a great innovation strategy that's built on human-centered design and great foresight. That strategy still has to be executed. And for me, that successful implementation really centers around very strong uh, multidiscipline or cross-functional teams that can move quickly to make it happen. And Caroline, before we reach the end of this episode, I have two more questions for you. Uh, so the first one is, uh, I'd like to hear from you, when you look back on your career at this tale, what would you say was your greatest innovation rock star moment so far? I think it, it comes back to teamwork and the incredible privilege and amazing experience of just working with a fantastic cross-functional team over the last 18 months during lockdown. I think that's been my, my greatest innovation experience so far. Great one. And finally, you know, when we look into the future or try to look ahead, what does your personal future actually hold? Well, Chris, I think um, the future is an incredibly exciting place. I really look forward to all of the changes that it brings and the many, many opportunities that it will provide for us to think differently and to find new frontiers for growth. So I think the, the future and its many scenarios are very, very exciting places. I guess personally, uh, from an innovation perspective, we have a couple of projects in the pipeline and it would be great if one of two of those could really land with disruptive impact and land in a way that really meets unmet, unmet needs of the consumer in future. But time will have to tell that. Time will tell, for sure. Um, and excited to see what these, you know, innovations and your products possibly could be. I'll definitely uh, look out for that. Um, yeah, and with that, we have reached the end of this episode already. So Caroline, thank you again for sharing your story and your valuable experiences. It was a pleasure to listen to you. Thank you, Chris. And to everybody listening or watching, if you want to learn more about this story or get in touch, uh, simply leave us a comment on this episode or just drop us an email at info at innovationrockstars.show. So that's it. Thanks for listening and see you in the next episode. Take care and bye-bye. Innovation Rockstars. This was Caroline Snyman talking about why purpose-led innovation has become a truly business-critical capability. If you want to dive deeper into the topic of purpose, innovation capability, or if you'd simply like to give us feedback on this episode, just email us at info at innovationrockstars.show. For more inspiring innovation stories, visit our website at www.innovationrockstars.show or browse through our Innovation Rockstars channel on all major podcast platforms. 